Well, hello, hello, and welcome again. Welcome to this week's program. Delia Smith is a one-woman cooking phenomenon whose word has been law for the past four decades. It's so easy that it's even easier than making it from a packet. In this program, we'll be lifting the lid on the 80s, when her complete cookery course hit the screens and stormed the bestsellers list. It was like a ray of sunshine, really, that hit the TV screens. Oh, goodness me, is that how you do it? Now I know. And she introduced the art of cooking to the younger generation. <laughs> it had to happen. It had to happen. The 80s was the decade when mobiles were bigger and portions were smaller. Where shares went up and the wall came down. And pop music managed to make a real difference in the lives of thousands. Of course, Delia has to leap into action too, doesn't she? And Delia will be rediscovering some of her favourite 80s dishes, like spaghetti carbonara and squidgy chocolate log. And that's exactly what it is. It's very squidgy and never been known to fail. Everybody absolutely thinks it's yummy. The decade of Maggie, Madge, and Miami Vice. It was a very flash decade. All flash clothes, flash cars, and flash dance. Seventies kitsch made way for the eighties bitch. Shoulder pads, hair, and phones were all very big. Frankie said. But the Green Goddess wouldn't let us. On, bend the knees. Legs were warm and wham were cool. That's how bad it was. But ignoring the 80s gods, cash, flash and trash, Delia started the decade with a smash. Her complete cookery course was an innovation in TV cooking. It actually taught people how to cook. Welcome to the cookery course. I hope those of you who haven't had any experience of cooking at all are going to find a good basic groundwork here. A program like that, teaching people the basics of cooking, was never going to entertain people. It was only going to ever be for people who wanted to learn. Now, another thing that helps to stop an egg cracking um, whilst it's boiling is to make a little prick. You just put a needle in at the end like this, press it in, goes in quite easily. This wasn't how to be clever and how to, you know, make your friends gasp. It was basic cooking, you know, the very, very basics. And I always felt, and I still feel that now, if you learn the basics of cooking, you can go on. Take a whisk. I think a balloon whisk is the best sort to use for this. But first, Delia herself had to go back to basics. Gently. I didn't have any professional training, so therefore I didn't understand recipes myself. And so because it was the further education department of uh, BBC, they employed somebody with a kind of scientific background to help me to understand why these things are rules in cooking. So, so when a recipe says, don't overbeat the egg whites, what's overbeating them? What does that mean? Why shouldn't you overbeat them? I've got my egg whites all ready to be beaten up. So I got to learn with her help. When you whip up the egg whites, you know, you get air into the egg whites and then bubbles expand and expand and expand. And if you overbeat them, the bubbles burst, you lose the air and then it's not quite as light. So I, I found out that a lot of the main ingredient in a lot of cooking is air. It was like a ray of sunshine, really, that hit the TV screens. Oh, goodness me, is that how you do it? Now I know. First of all, put a tablespoonful of the egg white into the chocolate mix and just fold it because it becomes thick when the egg goes in. The idea was really to save people trekking out to night school. Why shouldn't they be able to learn to cook in the comfort of their own homes? And there was, I felt, so much to teach and so much to communicate. She gave you every detail. She told you how much butter, actually the weight, the measure, the time, and every little nuance of how you cut the onions and everything. And these have been cooking in two tablespoons of butter and two tablespoons of oil. She's a home economics teacher who wants her class to do better and they want to please her. 
In the 80s, as far as eating out went, we were becoming a lot more adventurous with all sorts of international cuisine. Back in the home, though, we were a bit more cautious. Oh, yes, it is a surprise. No, I haven't cooked it before. Yes, it is foreign. No, Jason, it's not a hamburger. Yes, Alison Dolly will love it. No, Nick, no garlic. And Michael. Remember Preston. Delia was always keen for us to be a bit more adventurous. First of all, a crushed clove of garlic. Yet again, a clove of garlic. Again, a clove of garlic. Although some people were always going to be hard to convince. Oh, here's a letter from Mrs Hoochin of Kensington. I only hope we get the accent right, Mrs Hoochin. Could you please ask Delia Smith why she doesn't put garlic in her scones, since she's so keen on using it in everything else? I hate this stuff and the people who breathe all over me reeking of it. Yes, well, I, I will ask Delia, but not today. You see, I've been eating garlic. And I make no apologies. This is for people who like their garlic unadulterated. But while garlic scones never took off, most people were prepared to give things a go. If Delia said it was OK, it was OK. That's called lasagna, and that makes a really delicious dish, one of my very favourites, baked lasagna. And she took people firmly by the hand to show them the way. Take a few strands, lift them up, and then take them to the edge of the plate. Twist the fork round on the plate, or you can do this on a spoon, and then lift it up so that you've got a bite-sized piece like that. And don't worry if you've got a couple of little strands like that hanging down, because Italians always eat spaghetti with their napkins tucked into their chins. Next week, egg-sucking for the over-60s. The 80s was the decade when the home cook really embraced pasta. And Delia still enjoys making one of her favourite recipes at her home in Suffolk. It's spaghetti carbonara. And spaghetti carbonara was in fact bacon and egg pasta. And we used to make it with um, smoked English bacon and parmesan cheese. But now we can get so many more Italian ingredients. It's more authentic if you make it with this which is pancetta. And you start off with a frying pan. You don't need to put any oil or fat in the pan because the pancetta has got enough to cook on its own. Just move it around in the pan and let it cook until all the fat has run out and it's browned a little tiny bit. The other bit of the sauce is in my bowl here and I've got two egg yolks and two whole eggs. And over here, I've got some thick double cream. I'm going to add some pepper. I'm not going to put any salt because there's some in the bacon. And now we're just going to whisk this together. And then cooking the pasta, you really do have to read what it says on the packet. In any case, it should be never overcooked and soggy. It should be what the Italians call al dente to the teeth. Now we're going to add another authentic Italian ingredient. This is pecorino cheese, and I've put it in my chopper here because I want to show you the easy way of doing it without having to sort of grate it. Pecorino cheese is a sheep's cheese, and it's made in Tuscany, but it has a lovely kind of sharp, more assertive flavour than Parmesan. And it's perfect for this. It really does make a difference for this particular recipe. So here we go with the pasta. And this all has to happen quite quickly. What you do is you drain the pasta. Give it a little shake. Back into the saucepan. Doesn't matter if a few drops of water are clinging to it. That's all the better. Back over here is the lovely pancetta. Followed by the sauce. And then what we're going to do now is quite a good bit of stirring because what happens is the egg yolks are just very lightly cooked, making that wonderful bacon, egg and cheese sauce. And we're done. And use these lovely things, which are pasta tongs, which make life very much easier. Lift it up high and down onto the plate. And then a little bit more of this lovely country flavoured pecorino cheese on the top and you have pasta carbonara.
The 70s had been the decade of strikes and shortages, but life in the 80s took a sharp turn for the better. This was the time of excess, when greed was good, and if you had it, you flaunted it. Anyone with the readies could invest in one of the latest technological wonders, the microwave oven. Turn on the turntable, turn on the, the oven. What have I done wrong? That's it. No, it's not working. Can't work that way. Well. Hmm. If that was too complicated for you, there was always the new sandwich toaster. Hundreds of different fillings, all too hot to eat. And if that was too complicated, you could try making one of the latest snacks. Hot noodle. And if that was too complicated for you, well, quite frankly, you should be in a home. Hot noodle! Mind you, eating out for the yuppies could be a maddening experience, too. It was all about nouvelle cuisine. That's French for the more you spend, the less you get. We were looking at towers, drizzles, sprinkles, um, tiddly little things, turned vegetables, baby this, baby that. I mean, if somebody gives me a thimble full of smoked haddock souffle and it's delicious, absolutely wonderful. I just want, you know, I just want, you know, a big plate of it. I don't want to just have this little kind of teaser. You know, it has its place, but it doesn't have its place at home. So here, for people who like to be able to see their food without a magnifying glass, is Delia's classic 80s starter, smoked fish creams. First cut the haddock into squares and place in a blender. Next, add two lightly beaten eggs, season with salt and pepper and some freshly grated nutmeg. Then blend until the fish has turned into a smooth paste. Cover the mixture with cling film and leave it in the fridge overnight. When you're ready to cook, return the mixture to the blender, add double cream and then give it another really thorough blending. Now line the base and sides of eight greased ramekins with little bits of smoked salmon making them fit. Add the mixture and when they're three quarters full, place them in a roasting tin filled with an inch of boiling water and cook for 30 minutes until the tops puff up and become browned. I like to serve them turned out onto a plate and the best way to do this is to hold the ramekin with a cloth and then slide a palette knife round the edge. Then tip it very quickly out into your hand and then onto a plate. Now all this is going to need is some lovely foaming hollandaise sauce. In the 80s, supermarkets wanted to sell cut-price food and factory farming seemed the answer. Unfortunately, cutting corners meant taking risks and resulted in a barrage of food scares. The number of people who've died from food poisoning at a Yorkshire hospital has now risen to 18. Eggs were off. Edwina said they had salmonella. Beef was off, if you didn't want to get mad cow disease. And soft cheese was off. Or rather, if it was off, you might get listeria. Standing against all this madness was Delia's common sense complete cookery course. We have, in fact, got a book to go with the series. Which had become a publishing phenomenon. They shot to the top of the bestsellers list and stayed there throughout the 80s. Those books are handed down to the daughters and still handed down to the daughters of today. They'll never go away. Why? Because every single dish works. The complete cookery course inspired a whole new generation of TV chefs. Well, hello, and welcome to today's programme, which is all about fish. Well, I was very uh, taken with Delia, because uh, I was trying to learn how to cook, to be honest. I had a restaurant, I was open, but um, I still had a long way to go. And she, I was one of, you know, the, the, the sort of viewers that she's had ever since. I was somebody that needed to learn more. Well, you start off with... Six herring fillets. The audiences were very high. The audience reaction was very high. I mean, I had a few blips on my audiences, like um, 
If I was up against Top of the Pops, it was a bit difficult, or the Muppets. I remember the Muppets had 21 million. I, f I forget how, you know, I had, I had audience blips, and I remember one night I was doing a programme on chicken, and it was when Robbie and Cousins won a gold medal in the Olympics, and I don't think I got many <laughs> viewers that night. Just to think, thanks to him, thousands of people don't know how to make coco vin. I hope he's thoroughly ashamed of himself. Despite the blips, the success of the cookery course on TV and in print had made Delia Smith a wealthy woman. She was a TV and publishing phenomenon. Even her agent was surprised at what she had unleashed on an unsuspecting world. To be somebody like Delia, who's not an entertainer, who's really educating you, you don't associate that with making a lot of money. And I think that took a while for me to realise that, boy, oh boy... She was in a very unusual p position. Nobody was like her, and actually nobody is like her. I don't want you ever to worry about lumps. You shouldn't get lumps if you follow the instructions, but if you do, then just use a sieve, because that's what sieves are made for. Her extraordinary success surprises some and irritates others, but the secret of this success is quite simple. She knows what people want, and she gives it to them on a plate. Whilst there are a minority of people going out to smart restaurants, eating so-called smart food, there are millions of people coming home from work having to get a meal on the table every night. And, you know, when people get all snobby and can't understand why my books sell, they just can't, can't get it, you know? That's why. By this time, Delia had won over some younger fans with her appearances on Saturday morning children's TV. And then a work of art came winging in. Now, have a look at this. Come from Wendy Hauser, and Wendy says, I was going to draw John Craven, but it sort of ended up as Delia Smith. <laughs> it's an easy mistake to make, as was giving Noel Edmonds a food mixer. OK, you can make it at a faster speed. <laughs> <laughs> it had to happen. It had to happen. One of these days, it had to happen. I think it's one of those mornings. And to prove she could take anything life threw at her, there was her short-lived career as a backing singer for Keith Chegwin. Now, can you tell which is Delia and which is John Craven? Well, his hair's a little bit longer. I bet Banana Rama was shaking in their stiletto boots. Oh. Would you like another song now? Um, no, thank you. Delia does get thousands of requests, but not for her singing. Some of her recipes have been used time and time again, and certain ones get their own fan mail. Now we're going to have a little bit of fun and make something called a squidgy chocolate log. And that's exactly what it is. It's very squidgy and never been known to fail. Everybody absolutely thinks it's yummy. There are people who write to me now and say... I always have a squidgy chocolate log, and it was obviously one of the most popular recipes in the cookery course. So here we go then. I'm melting chocolate now that's going to go in a kind of chocolate mousse filling. And what you do here is break it up into squares with a little bit of water. Put it over a pan of barely simmering water, just the water's just moving. When it's melted, mix in the yolks of two large eggs. Then allow it to cool. Next, fold in the beaten white of those eggs and pop it all into the fridge. So that's the filling done. Now for the cake itself, which is going to be made with eggs, sugar, cocoa powder, no flour, no butter. Whisk up six egg yolks and add some sugar. Last thing to go in is this, and this is good old-fashioned cocoa powder, and it's the best. It's not um, drinking chocolate. All we're going to do with that is sift it, because sometimes it has a few little lumps in it, in to join the egg yolks. Whisk that all in, and then you fold in the beaten egg whites using a metal spoon. Right, last lot going in now. Once the mixture is perfectly combined, Pour it into a greased-lined baking tin and bake for 20 to 25 minutes. Then, 
in, when it's quite cold, and don't worry, it will shrink down, turn it out onto a piece of baking parchment dusted with icing sugar. Then peel off the greased paper, and now it's ready for our squidgy filling. So you can take the chocolate mixture out of the fridge and then spread it carefully all over the base. That's going to be followed by another rather wicked ingredient, whipped double cream. And that's going to be spread out in just exactly the same way as the chocolate. Then what we're going to do is roll it up. And you take the piece of paper like this and you just hold your hand over the piece of paper and just keep on rolling and have courage and don't worry. Then when you've got it rolled, you can remove the paper and there you have your beautiful squidgy chocolate log and it's going to be very squidgy and very lovely. Delia gets plenty of feedback on her recipes. She's often approached by viewers who can come up with some very useful suggestions. I was in a supermarket shopping and um, a man came up to me and said, are you Delia Smith? And I said, yes. And he said, I just want to tell you that I just love your um, country pate. It's one of my favourite things. But he said, it serves 12 and I live alone. Would you ever think of doing a cookery book? just for people who live alone. She could have told him to go and find 11 friends, but instead she came up with the idea of one is fun. One cream, one is fun. A tea for two is double. A three is so much trouble. One is fun. Hello and welcome to a brand new cookery series. We had a black background and I remember one of the reviewers when it actually went out saying it looked as if I was cooking in a nightclub. <laughs> More like a power cut in Kew Gardens. We're going to end up with a very quick little cold supper dish for a hot summery day. And that involves six ounces of salmon, fresh salmon. That may sound a bit extravagant, but when you're only buying it for one, it doesn't seem too bad somehow. By now, Delia was big enough to be part of the BBC stable of stars. And to promote her latest show, she could count on other BBC thoroughbreds to help. It's Delia Smith. So, blinking against the light in June 1985, she appeared for the very first time on Wogan. Can I try a little bit of this? Yes, this, this, <laughs> this could... The truth. This the could truth. scarcely be called a cheap meal, though. No, this one isn't a cheap meal. This is for when you've been really working hard and you deserve a treat. As always, there was a book to go with the series, also called One is Fun. It quickly became the bedsit bible for singletons. My granny was a real fan of Delia, loved her, and had some of her books. And when I went to Oxford, she gave me One is Fun, I think. I don't know what kind of existence she thought I was going to have there, but never mind. I think from that book, I got a recipe. I hope it's that book, but it certainly is a Delia recipe, which I adored and I love now, which is her kidneys stroganoff, which is a fantastic for a student budget because kidneys are very much cheaper than fillet steak and just sort of nutmeg, onions, sour cream, a bit of paprika. And I do remember, uh, of course, the mushrooms, and I do remember that. And I think probably it was the first time I'd ever cooked a recipe from a recipe book because I just cooked normally. And... Uh, I love that recipe. The 80s saw the birth of a new species of urban animal, the yuppie. Herds of these young, upwardly mobile professionals gathered at their local watering holes, the wine bar. Get you anything? Uh, yes, sir, please, sir, John. <coughs> Bottle of Beaujolais Nouveau. Yes, sir. <coughs> a 79. The females went in for a junior Miss Executive look with big hair and even bigger shoulders. The male of the species could be distinguished by the parallel lines running down their chests. Both sexes like to display phylofaxes and smug looks. I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm having a dinner party and I've run out of coffee. <laughs> Come in. Thank you. But the 80s was a decade of disturbing contrasts. While rich city types were paying a fortune for tiny portions arranged like modern art, 
In the third world, people had nothing to eat at all. Ethiopia was suffering one of the worst famines in living history, and thousands were dying of starvation. Dawn, and as the sun breaks through the piercing chill of night on the plain outside Coram, it lights up a biblical famine, now in the 20th century. Help for hundreds and thousands of starving Ethiopians would come from a surprising source. Inspired and instigated by Bob Geldof, the Band Aid single led to a huge concert event simultaneously held on both sides of the Atlantic to raise money for famine relief. On July the 13th, 1985, 400 million people watched Live Aid. Here we are, here we are. Just for that moment, I think I saw human life as it was meant to be. Everybody together, everybody with the same purpose. And not, you know, with the same purpose, just, you know, sort of doing something good, but actually enjoying it, you know, and the music was amazing. I just, I, I'll never, ever forget it. But of course, Delia has to leap into action too, doesn't she? Luckily, she decided not to pursue her pop career. Her plan was to create a recipe book filled with enough celebrity contributions for it to sell in large numbers and raise money for the Live Aid cause. I mean, it's slightly incongruous to think that food should be helping the starving. I put that question to Delia, and uh, as ever, she was devious. Because it was a question, an obvious question that needed to be asked. Is, is a food book relevant when you're talking about people starving? I think it's right that food should help famine. And on our own, we can't just ship off the food that we have to help the starving, but we can do other things to share them. And I think um, it's just trying to mobilise the food industry mm. and the public into sharing what they have. And it's very important to get away from this guilt thing. I remember, you know, trying to get various famous people to give me recipes, which they did. And the most famous person who gave me a recipe immediately in about, you know, the first week, was Princess Diana. You can tell me. What, what is it? Tuna fish bake? <laughs> no, 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 it isn't. No. I'm afraid, Rusk Terry... Rusk in white wine? I'm afraid, Terry, you have to buy the book to find out what the recipe is. It was watercress soup, and thousands of people bought the book to find out. We had a big celebration with all the people who'd con contributed the recipes, and Terry Wogan and I presented Bob Geldof with a cheque for half a million pounds. So we'd done our bit, you know, for the cause. And it wasn't the only time Delia got behind a good cause. She came up with a recipe for Red Nose Day that was drop-dead gorgeous. Chocolate button mini muffins. Do you like the sound of that? Oh, I think it sounds absolutely lovely. That's in the next programme, when we'll be looking at the 90s. The decade when Britannia was cool, when celebrity chefs were hot and the Spice Girls were wannabes. Delia's decade started with Christmas. What I hope to do, by sharing my own Christmas with you, is give you just a little bit of help along the way. Followed by summer and winter. Well, here's a little selection from the winter collection. And she'll be revisiting some of her favourite recipes, like chicken basque and that dinner party classic, Piedmont Peppers. How can anything so simple and easy to make taste so wonderful? And we'll be looking at the Delia effect, when the mere mention of a new ingredient caused great excitement. Yeah. Stella could do with some cranberries, yes. Cranberries, yes. <laughs> and I hope, like me, you've got a little something put by to brighten up any of those dull winter days. Bye-bye. Sticking in the 80s, the decade that promised choice, ambition and wealth and that changed the British family forever next on BBC Two. Powerful film drama over on BBC Four now. Sophie Ocanido stars as Mrs Mandela.